Can you see your faults? Or better yet, do you own up to your faults? Have you ever looked at your life and blamed what was wrong on your parents? Here's another one. Have you ever looked at some of your mom and dad's actions or habits and said, I don't want to do that? Well, today, God will speak to the captive children of Israel about this very topic. Through the prophet Ezekiel, street preacher to the exiles. It's the day, it's the day. Another edition of Sunday School with the Deek. I'm Deacon Wallace Hill IV, proud member of the Mount Pisgah Missionary Baptist Church, where my father, Wallace Hill III, is the pastor. It's an honor for me to have you take time out of your busy schedule to spend 45 minutes with me doing the Sunday School lessons based on the International Lesson Series. Now, for those of you that are new, do me a favor, hit the subscribe button at the bottom of the page, then click that little bell right next to it, and each week you'll be notified, ding, 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 the Deke has uploaded another lesson. And I do believe we had four new subscribers in the last two weeks, so for those of you who have just joined the family, I appreciate you. And I hope you enjoy the lessons. Now, the goal of Sunday School with the Deke is to bring the Word of God to life in your life and to give you an understanding of the Scriptures and make the Word of God real and interesting and an integral part of your day-to-day -day being and have a little bit of fun while we do it. Ultimately, I would hope that these lessons will inspire those of you who don't have a relationship with Christ to ask, what must I do to be saved? Now, I laughed when I came on because it is now uh, 1.15 a.m. Saturday morning, and I just did a welcome. <laughs> I know my whole house is mad at me right now while they're trying to sleep. Anyway, we got to get it in where we can get it in, right? Okay. So today, uh, we continue our final, in our final unit of the spring quarter. Now this will be the final lesson of, that I teach for this quarter. Uh, in two weeks, we'll be in our summer quarter, which means we will be having our new books. And as I say every three months, if you need a book, please let me know, and I'll get you one. Uh, if you're not in town, I'll mail you one on my dime. Just all you got to do is say, Deke. Can you send me a book? <laughs> All right. So the last time, um, this last unit, I'm sorry, has been about uh, courageous prophets of change from the Old Testament. And so today, next up in the courageous prophet category is Ezekiel. Uh, now let's get a little bit of background on Ezekiel before we get to the background of the lesson. Now, Ezekiel 1 and 3 opens up and says, and tells us that Ezekiel was a priest, but he never got to officially serve in that capacity because he was captured with the exiles and taken to Babylon uh, to be in Babylonian captivity during the reign of King uh, Jehoiakim. Uh, Jehoiakim was the king of, of, of uh, Israel or Judah, excuse me. Now, King Nebuchadnezzar, who was the king of Babylon at the time, and if you know your captivity history, you'll know that Babylon captured Judah in three different phases. They went into Jerusalem three different times and captured more people each time. And the last time is when they destroyed the city completely. So the first time Nebuchadnezzar went in, 
it was under King Jehoiakim. Uh, this is when he took Daniel uh, as one of the captives. And we all know the story of Daniel and, and how they tried to change him into these perfect kids. And the, the, the Daniel's fast came from that and all of that. Anyway, so the second time Nebuchadnezzar went in, it was under King Jehoiakim. Jehoiakim, excuse me. And that's where Ezekiel was taken. And then the third time Nebuchadnezzar went in, it was under King Zedekiah. Uh, and that's when they destroyed the whole nation and tore down the walls and took all the valuables and burnt down the city. Um, so, uh, and, and then at that point, that marked the final destruction of Jerusalem. Now, at the time Ezekiel was a prophet, Jeremiah was also a prophet. And he, but he was getting old and he was prophesying to mostly the remnant uh, 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 of the poor people that Nebuchadnezzar left in Jerusalem to take care of the land. And then Daniel was uh, uh, rising up in the ranks in Babylon, though. He was in Babylonian captivity as well. Uh, but he was, God was had his hand on him. Um, and we all know some of those stories, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, all of that. So Ezekiel had been taken with the captives uh, and they had been moved to, a, um, to one of the rivers of Babylon. They had moved to a, a, a canal off the river Euphrates, which was almost 100 miles from Babylon. And this is the group of people that Ezekiel was ministering to or prophesying to. So take a look at these two passages of Scripture. Psalms 137, 1 and 2, and then Ezekiel 1 and 1. Now Psalms 137, 1 and 2 says... By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we wept. We remembered Zion. We hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. So that, that shows you that that psalm was written by some of those exiles uh, who uh, were making songs about reminiscing of the times they were back in Jerusalem. Uh, and then Ezekiel 1 and 1 says, Now it came to pass in the thirteenth year, in the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives by the river Chebar, that the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. Now, while the people were feeling sorry for themselves, Ezekiel was seeing visions of God. And so, Jeremiah Daniel and Ezekiel were all prophets at the same time, but they were all prophesying to different groups of people. Um, and the Bible doesn't talk about them uh, ever meeting each other, but I got to believe they all knew about each other. So, and they, they say that Ezekiel's writings are the most spiritual of the three. So, at the time, there was a lot of false prophets. They were springing up everywhere, giving people false hope of them getting out of captivity and that Jerusalem was not going to be destroyed. Well, Jeremiah and Ezekiel kept telling the people to return to God or Jerusalem would be destroyed. And eventually it was destroyed. So, Ezekiel became a prophet at about 30 years old. It was, he became a prophet while he was in Babylonian captivity. Uh, he had been in captivity about five years, and that's when God called him at that point. So, but the people would not listen to his message. They listened to false prophets. And, and Ezekiel had a lot of strange ways of trying to get people to listen to him, y'all. And, and, and granted, he was just doing what God told him to do. But, you know, when they didn't listen to his words, God had him resort to acting out his words in a bunch of strange ways. Uh, one time, Ezekiel walked into a house locked himself in, and then started digging himself out of it. And when he came out, he was in the middle of the street. And, and people started wondering what was going on with this guy. You know, um, and then Ezekiel at that point gave them a, a message from God. That was in Ezekiel 12, uh, verses 8 through 16. And see, this was God's way of trying to get the people's attention because they just wouldn't listen to him when he was just talking regular to them. You know, one interesting fact about Ezekiel is that he was actually muted by God. Now you might say, huh, what's that? You know, if you look at chapter 3 of Ezekiel, you'll see uh, where God muted him. Verse 26 of chapter 3 says, 
and I will make your tongue stick to the roof of your mouth so that you will be speechless and unable to rebuke them for they are rebels. See, God shut them up uh, in dealing with those people because they weren't listening to them anyway. See, but in the very next verse, verse 27, you'll see that uh, his mute, his being muted was him being muted from speaking his own words. See, he was still able to talk to God and he was able to talk to the exiles of only what God told him. If you look at verse 27, it says, But when I speak with you, I will open your mouth, and you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord God, He who hears, let him hear, and he who refuses, let him refuse, for they are a rebellious house. So God was limiting Ezekiel's speech to the exiles. He was only able to speak you know, the prophetic words that God wanted him to say, and God allowed him to speak to Israel. Uh, and so if you look at uh, verse 27, it says, the reason it says towards Israel is because in the very next chapter, chapter 4, you'll see Ezekiel was allowed to talk to God. And I mentioned that earlier. Um, uh, and, and did you notice how in Ezekiel 3 and 27, how it was phrased, it said God will allow him to speak to the exiles, but only... He, he would only be able to lead with, thus says the Lord. And thus says the Lord God is found 122 times in the book of Ezekiel. But before he was muted, it was only used twice. Uh, and that was in Ezekiel 2 and 4 and Ezekiel 3 and 11. So see how this thing works out. So in chapter 24 of Ezekiel, God is going to give him his voice back. And this is going to be like seven and a half years later when Jerusalem was completely destroyed. He gave him his voice back. God told Ezekiel he, he was going to take away his dearest treasure, which was his wife. And when she dies, God told him he could not cry or show any emotion. He said, you can groan silently, but no wailing or crying at the grave. Uh, don't perform no, no rituals of death. Don't accept any food from anybody who friends who trying to console you. Um, and then the next day his wife died and, and Ezekiel did everything God told him to do. And all the people were watching. They were saying like, what does this mean? And God told him to tell the people he was going to take away their pride and joy. Um, which wasn't their wives, but it was their temple back in Jerusalem. The place where their heart was, the place of their security, the place of their pride. You see, they cherished the temple more than they did the God who gave it to them. Um, uh, so, he says, your sons and daughters back in Jerusalem will be slaughtered. And you, uh, and you better do just like Ezekiel did. And not cry or perform any rituals or accept any food from consoling friends. And this is how you would know, I am Lord. So it was at that point that God said, I will give you your voice back to, uh, to Ezekiel in, in verse 27. And then for the next 24 chapters, he was able to speak more than just what thus said the Lord. Um, God actually starts to give him messages of hope to the people at that point. And I thought that was just a little interesting uh, stuff. You know, whenever I think things are interesting when I'm studying, I try to give it to you. You know, I like to drop little nuggets on you here and there. And I didn't even bring up the time when God told him to make some, mix some food together, make some bread and heat it with some human boo-boo. <laughs> Ezekiel begged him not to make him do it. So God settled for letting him heat it up uh, with uh, animal poop. <laughs> So, you see how I didn't even bring that up. Anyway, uh, the book of Ezekiel uh, is valuable to help us to understand the life of the exiles when they were in Babylon. They had been cut off from Jerusalem uh, and its temple, which for them was the only place that God dwelled. Uh, and that's the only place God could be worshipped. So, the exiles were faced with a crisis here of faith a crisis of their practices 
because they were away from their beloved Jerusalem. And so Ezekiel tried to sustain the exiles by keeping their rituals going and traditions alive while they were in captivity. His prophecies uh, did a lot to help get rid of the notion that God could only dwell in Jerusalem. And lastly, one of the biggest points uh, that was emphasized was the importance of individual responsibility. Which brings us to our lesson today in chapter 18. We'll begin uh, by talking a lot about uh, being responsible for your own actions and not trying to put the blame on anybody else. Ezekiel's calling for Israel to repent as individuals and not necessarily as a nation. It's one of those instances where you can look at it almost like he could be talking to us today. It kind of deals with the thought uh, that when a, when a father sins, the consequences are brought on to their children. And I'll admit some, some things our parents do have a lasting effect on their children. Uh, but the bottom line is the children have their own responsibility. And each person has his own life to be concerned with. So, and you'll see that here in chapter 18. I know that's probably like 16 minutes of an intro, but I guarantee you we're going to get out of here in good time. So let's jump into the lesson. Today we're in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 18, verses 1 through 9 and verses 31 and 32. Our lesson date is Sunday, May 23rd, 2021. Our lesson is entitled, Ezekiel, Street Preacher to the Exiles. Grab your Bibles, grab your books, grab your pens, grab your paper, and let's get into today's lesson. Verse 1. The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, this came unto me again, saying, now, it's clear that this isn't the first message that has been delivered, and it also tells us that he's making sure that the people know that these are not his words, but words from the Lord. And he's trying to make sure it was distinct from the last message he gave them. So we'll go to verse 2. What mean ye? Now this is God talking through Ezekiel. What mean ye that you use the proverb concerning the land of Israel saying, The fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. If you remember a couple weeks ago we had the same verse in Lamentations when we studied, studied Jeremiah. But anyway, let me set the scene up for you. During the time of Ezekiel's prophecy, much of Judah was in Babylonian captivity, right? All the warnings that God had gave them through Amos and Micah and Isaiah and Jeremiah and, uh, um, had come and gone. The prophecy has come to pass, and because of all the wrongs of the people, and their unwillingness to listen to God, they are now in captivity. They are slaves to Babylon, and now we find them sitting in captivity, re, you know, reciting uh, proverbs. <laughs> you know, ain't that funny how, you know, we can uh, really find God when we start to go through stuff, right? We start pulling out the Bible, you know, reading, you know, some scriptures that, you know, that we remembered over the years. And we start Googling what's going on in our life, trying to figure out what scripture go with it so we can read that scripture. Uh, you know, uh, you get there and you go, okay, uh, a scripture uh, for when you keep ignoring God and uh, you keep doing it over and over again. And, oh, okay, here it is. Uh, thou art dumbest. <laughs> anyway, just kidding. Uh, the people here find themselves reciting Proverbs, and, and, and God tells them that they are wrong in their understanding of, of what the Scriptures are. So, there's a couple of places that use this proverb where, you know, I told you in Lamentations, uh, verses 5 and uh, chapter 5 verse 7 and also in Jeremiah 31 29 they, they both use this to say you guys are reciting scripture wrong right it's, 
They're saying our fathers have sinned and are not, and we have borne of their iniquities. That's what Lamentations 5 and 7 says. But the people were looking for a place to place their blame, and they wanted to place blame on why they were in the position that they were in. They took these verses, <laughs> they took these proverbs, and they used them to say that it's their parents' fault for the condition that they're in. You know, and you could partly say so, but remember, these people that are in, in, in captivity were off the chain. You know, they act like they didn't do nothing. Uh, but they were, you know, they were no different than us, though. They were searching to put the blame on somebody other than themselves. And, you know, we always want to know why God has done something uh, to us or with us. You know, we always want to pinpoint the problem or we always want a solution. And these people put the blame on their blame of their situation on their fathers. You know, Ezekiel opens up and says, why are you quoting this proverb uh, in your state of captivity? You know, God is going to have Ezekiel let the people know that you can't be pinning the blame on other people. It, now, don't get me wrong. I do believe in generational curses. Uh, you know, but it's up to each individual to, to, to pull or claw their way out of those curses. You know, you can sometimes look at families and you see where, you know, the mama got pregnant at 17 and the daughter gets pregnant at 17 and then the daughter's daughter gets pregnant at 17. You know, and I'm only using that as, a, as a one example. And this, you know, there's nothing, uh, I'm not, you know, putting one thing over another. But experience tells us that there's some truth to this. You know, children do suffer some of the sins of their parents. Um, the children of dysfunctional parents are more likely to suffer uh, dysfunction than their friends uh, who are, have more functional families. So we also see exceptions to this rule. People from dysfunctional families a lot of times rise up above their circumstances and live normal lives. And I say all the time it's up to us to recognize what those flaws are and go the other route. Here they were saying our fathers have eaten sour grapes but yet our lips are the ones that are puckered up and stuck together, right? In other words, what you ate made me sick. <laughs> so they're mad saying they shouldn't feel the pain caused by the food that they never tasted. And you know, where did they get this proverb? You know, they took it from Exodus 20, 3 through 5, and they took it out of context. Um, uh, and, and, the, and, and the verses say in verse 3, you must not have any other God but me. You must, verse 4, you must not make for yourself an idol of any kind or any image of anything in the heavens or on the earth or in the sea. Verse 5, you must not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. I lay the sins of the parents on their children. The entire family is, in, is affected even children in the third and fourth generations of those who reject me. So, they took that verse and they made a proverb saying that we're facing the punishment of what our fathers did. Verse 3. As I live, said the Lord God, ye shall not have occasion anymore to use this proverb in Israel. Uh, this is somewhat of an oath of God when he says, as I live. So God is, is taking an oath and telling Ezekiel to give it to the people. God, he said, tell them, I swear by my name. And there's obviously, there's no greater name to swear by. But he says, right here, tell, uh, this right here tells me how serious God was about this. He resented the fact that these people were trying to put their present misery off on, the, on their fathers when they themselves were just as bad. It's funny how you can see the issues of others, but you can't see your own issues. It, 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 it's even worse when the issues that you have are the same issues that they have. 
you know. So he look, a guy follows it up with a promise. He says that you will no longer have occasion to use this proverb, meaning that he wouldn't defer the execution uh, of his judgments anymore. I mean, you know, he wasn't going to give them grace because he's given them a lot of grace. And, and, and this way he wouldn't be able to they wouldn't be able to put it off on anybody else. So it says God is going to deal with them immediately so that they would know uh, it, it was their doing that got them in whatever predicament that they find themselves in. You know, God was going to make sure that the next generation wasn't, be, wasn't going to be able to put anything off on this present group of people. You know, they would have to acknowledge their own sins uh, and how those sins got them to, them to where they are. And that's the thing about how good God is. <laughs> we do wrong and nothing happens. And then so when then something does happen, you know, we don't know which wrong to pin it on because he's let us get by so much, right? Verse 4. Behold, all souls are mine. As the souls of the Father, so also the souls of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Man. All of us ought to get up right now and shout to the rafters just because God didn't play in the Old Testament, y'all. <laughs> he killed people on the spot. And, and he tells Ezekiel to tell them right here and there that your father's souls belong to me. Just like your soul belongs to me. And I'm going to make it simple for you. The one who sins is going to be the one who dies. So <laughs> now don't get me wrong. God wasn't going to kill them on the spot. But he, he would allow, he's going to allow for them to repent. But if they don't repent, then they'd be put to death. And they would know exactly why. You see, and so God was not going to defer any judgments <clears throat> anymore going forward. So, he was not going to exercise any patience. And, and they were not going to be able to hide behind their father's sins anymore. And so, uh, um, this concept was kind of came from the Mosaic law uh, that governed the people back then in Deuteronomy 24 and 16. If you look at that, it says, The father shall not be put to death for, their ch for the children, neither shall the children be put to death for the fathers. Every man shall be put to death for his own sins. So God was going to take that concept and use it for himself going forward. Verse 5. But if a man be just, and do that which is lawful and right. So it says, if a man be just and do what is lawful and right. So in the previous verse, God, God promised that the soul who sins is going to die. So he's not talking, now he's not talking uh, free from sin as, as we know that no man is free from sin, right? So he's talking about those who try to live by his statutes. And when they don't, they acknowledge the fact that they're wrong and they repent to God. And so, you know, they try to live lawful. They try to do what's right. And, and, and um, he also does right to his fellow man, uh, as you'll see in the next few verses. Now, Ezekiel is going to start to describe what kind of person this just man is or the nature of this just man if you look at verse 6, and he not eaten upon the mountains, neither have lifted up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, neither have defiled his neighbor's wife, neither have come near to a menstruous woman. Okay, I'm going to have to take this in four different parts here. Uh, and I'll try to let, tread lightly on the last one. <laughs> anyway, he says, this kind of person, this just person, have not eaten upon the hills. Now, this is where the temples and the altars were built for idols. And the sacrifices were offered up on the hills. Um, and so, you know, they wanted um, to act like it was their father's fault for where they found themselves. But they did this type of stuff. This is what they were doing, which, which got them in captivity. They were worshiping idol gods. And so God told Ezekiel, tell him, look, a just man won't worship idol gods. He won't eat upon the hills. And then the next one says, neither has he lifted up his eyes to the idols. Saying, you know, 
if a righteous and just man won't even consider worshiping idol gods. You know, he doesn't pray to them or have anything to do with them. And then the next one says, nor does he have sex with his neighbor's wife. Now, nothing has changed from today uh, to back then. Uh, you know, with cell phones and text messages, men and women can get creative with their cheating a day. But I can only imagine what it was like back then. You know, and it's funny that this verse is in our lesson because Thursday... <laughs> I was listening to a radio show on Sirius XM, and the topic of the day was, would you allow your husband or your wife to have a hall pass? Now, for those of you who don't know, a hall pass is basically where you give your husband or your wife a, you know, permission to go out and have sex you know, with an ex or something like that. Um, and so, you know, to my dismay, the, the callers that called in, it was, uh, it was like 50-50. You know, wives were, were saying, you know, as long as he pay the bills and, and he don't be catching no feelings for her, I'm good. You know, and one lady said, I don't be wanting to do it anyway so he can have it all passed. <laughs> it was crazy. You know, one guy, one guy was like, man, I've been married so long, I don't care what she do. You know, so... Uh, he's like, we don't sweat the small stuff anymore. Small stuff? What? <laughs> it was crazy. Um, but I need you to know, just because you and your wife or you and your husband uh, may be okay with it, it's still wrong in the eyes of God. So anyway, back to the lesson. Uh, this righteous person, Ezekiel talks about, you know, doesn't engage in none of these practices. And so the last one on the list is one I hope I don't know. I hope nobody ever took practice in or takes practice in. It, this should be an easy one to stay away from. He says, but since it's here, I'm assuming that it was a problem back then. First of all, you need to know that back then when a woman was on her cycle, she was considered unclean and she was set apart for a week. A man couldn't even, he couldn't even have sex with his own wife at the time uh, uh, until she was considered you know, because it was, it was considered a sin. She was not to be touched, and you couldn't even come in contact with anything she sat on or laid on. Look at Leviticus 15, 19. I'm going to read a few verses from this, uh, from the New Living Translations. And if a woman have an issue, <laughs> they call it an issue, and her issue is her flesh be blood, she shall be put apart seven days. And whosoever toucheth her shall be unclean until the even. And everything that she lieth upon in her separation shall be unclean. Everything also that she sitteth upon be unclean. And whosoever toucheth her bed shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. And whosoever toucheth anything that she sat upon shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. And if it be on her bed or on anything whereon she sitteth, when he toucheth it, he shall be unclean until the evening. And if a man lie with her and have sex with her uh, at all and, ha and her flowers be upon him, <laughs> he shall be unclean seven days. And all the bed whereupon he lieth shall be unclean. And if a woman have an issue of her blood many days out of the time of her separation, meaning her period went longer than it should have, uh, or if it run beyond the time of her separation, all the days of her issue of her uncleanliness shall be as the days of her separation. She shall be unclean. Every bed upon which she lieth all the days of her issue shall be unto her as the bed of her separation. And whatsoever she sitteth upon shall be unclean as the uncleanliness of her separation. And whosoever toucheth those things shall be unclean and shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. <laughs> uh, but if she be cleansed of her issue, then shall she uh, number to herself seven days and after that, she shall be clean. But look here what they had to do once they were off. And on the eighth day, she shall take a, 
unto her two turtles or two young pigeons and bring them to the priest to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Wow, you have to go through all of that to be on your cycle. Whew. Ezekiel said, you're a just man if you don't sleep with her when she's on her cycle. Verse 7, and have not oppressed any. He continued to talk about what kind of person a just man is. But hath restored to the debtor his pledge, hath spoiled none by violence, have given his bread to the hungry, and have covered the naked with a garment. So here are more character traits of the just man that Ezekiel is talking about. He doesn't oppress anyone, especially the poor. He doesn't fraud those who borrow from him. He doesn't keep the collateral or he doesn't steal the collateral. He hasn't spoiled none by violence. He has not committed theft or robbery or done anything to another person's body. He has given bread to the hungry and he has clothed the naked. These are the things we are called to do as Christians. Verse 8. He that, he that hath not given forth upon usury, neither hath taken any increase, that have withdrawn his hand from iniquity, had executed true judgment between man and man. Now, if you look at Deuteronomy 23 and 19, it says, Thou shalt not lend upon usury to thy brother. Usury of money, usury of victuals, usury of anything that is lent upon usury. Now, usury is just another word for interest. Right, he said, if you if you if you let somebody borrow some money, don't charge them interest. Right, uh, the type of person uh, who gives it uh, when he has it to give and doesn't hold it over the person's head when they do it, you know, it, the type of person who doesn't charge extra or seem to want more than what was borrowed, you know. The person who withdraws his hand from iniquity. This is the type of person who tries to stay away from doing wrong. Um, uh, the type of person that runs from doing wrong or even the look of doing wrong. That's big. You know, a lot of times you won't be doing wrong, but you may be standing in front of somewhere that would make you look like you're doing wrong. So it's that he that executed judgment between man and man. He's always looking to do the right thing. He's always looking to treat people fair. He's always looking to keep the peace. Verse 9. He walked in my statutes and have kept my judgments to deal truly. He is just. He shall surely live, said the Lord God. So, uh, this person walks right and gives God true worship. He's not fake. He observes all of God's statutes. And when he doesn't, he is blameless like Job. Now, blameless doesn't mean you don't do anything wrong. It just means you, you, you can't put the blame on you. Only person know about it is you and God. Ezekiel continues on with these characteristics of a just man. And he deals right with the people, and he, and he repents when he does wrong, right? This that type of person he is. Uh, he tries to honor and uphold God in, in his rightful place. This person shall surely live, and it doesn't matter what kind of father this person had, he will be judged on his own merits. Now, our lesson skips verses 10 through 30, uh, but Ezekiel goes on to give examples of a father that has a son who grows up to be a robber or a sinner and, and doesn't do right by God. And he, he, he does all kinds of things that the father would never do. Uh, he worships idols. He oppresses the poor. He commits adultery. God says this person will die. And then he goes on to say, what if a wick, that, that same wicked person has a son and he, he sees that all the wrong that his dad did and... Uh, and he lives a good, clean life. He does everything opposite of his dad. You know, God says he will live. He won't be punished for his father's wrongdoings, but he will live. So our lesson then skip, uh, picks back up in verse 31. It says, cast away from you all your transgressions, whereby ye have transgressed, and make you a new heart and a new spirit for why will ye die, O house of Israel? It says, cast away from you all your transgressions whereby ye have transgressed. Now, transgression 
means that you do something to somebody or do something wrong knowing good and well it was wrong when you did it. So that's what a transgression is. Um, so Ezekiel kind of ends this chapter by saying, look, it's time out for blaming others for your issues. God is not going to allow you to try to put this off on anybody else other than yourself. If your daddy wasn't no good, then you turn out to be, and you turn out to be no good. I'm not going to allow you to put it off on your daddy. <laughs> you got to stand for yourself. So verse 31 basically says, just get rid of all your transgressions and get right. Get yourself right. Is it really worth dying for? That's what Ezekiel said. Is this really, you know, I'm, I, you know, I'm going to make you stand up and deal with your own issues rather than letting you put them off on others. Serve and worship and do right by God and you will live. Verse 32. For I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, saith the Lord God. Wherefore, turn yourselves and live ye. He said, he said, God doesn't take any pleasure in, in, in them dying here in this book of Ezekiel. You know, uh, he doesn't take any pleasure of men and boys and girls and women dying a day either from not accepting Jesus Christ. So remember, man was never intended to die, you know, but that's why Jesus wept at the tomb of, of his friend Lazarus, even though he knew he was about to raise it from the dead. Just get right and everything will be all right. You know, it would be more agreeable to the Lord if you just turn from your wicked ways and walk in the right path. It's just that simple. Uh, it may not be that simple. I, I tend to say it's a struggle for all of us. But really, uh, uh, you know, if we could just get right and everything will be all right. So, let, let people see some God in you sometimes. People ought not be calling you the crazy one, right? Or the one that you bet not mess with. You know, I joke a lot, but seriously, for, from here on out, God was not allowing them to keep up with all these excuses as to why they act the way they act. And he's not going to allow us to do it either. You know, if you have sinful ways or if you have bad habits, if you smoke, drink, gamble, pimp, player, hustler, <laughs> if you're a cusser or, or you a loner like, or you talk too much and your parents did all of these things that I named, then guess what? You still have to take responsibility for your own actions. Um, I was watching this show that I had never seen before the other night. It was called like something like My 600 Pound Life or something like that. And I had never seen it before. But this lady was like 652 pounds. And she wanted to lose weight for her kids so she could be more interactive with them. And so the, the whole show went through, you know, she was losing weight and blah, blah, blah. And at the end, they showed a picture of her and she was with her kids. And them kids were well on their way to being like their mama. So, but at some point, we all have to, you know... Uh, we can't pin the blame on our parents. We got to take personal responsibility. Um, and that's pretty much the end of the lesson for today. Um, feels good to be back on the screen. I've been off a couple weeks and it's just been a lot. So I want you all to pray for me. Keep me in your prayers because this is something I want to do. Um, not something I have to do. Something I want to do. And so keep me in your prayers. I appreciate you guys working with me as I try to find some rest during the summer. Um, in two weeks, we'll begin our summer quarter. Our lesson will be from the book of Matthew. Uh, it's the sixth chapter, uh, verses 25 through 34. And the lesson is entitled, Why Do You Worry? Mm, that's going to be a good one. This is one of my most favorite passages of scripture ever. Uh, so I'll be looking forward to that. And I made it through this lesson with my glasses on. It's, it's 2 o'clock in the morning, so I have to wear my glasses. Um, uh, so, anyway, as I say every week, hit the subscribe button, uh, comment, and share. Your comments help me, and your sharing the lesson will help others by planting a seed. Let's dismiss you guys. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart 
be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Sunday school with the Deacon.